look at the numbers. There is no need for additional more care. But I ask to have the same opportunity for everyone. Demanding the freedom to ride, the debate over permits that left Will spinning for some cab drivers. One plus one is two. It doesn't matter where you are. The universal language of math, the San Diego classrooms that are translating the linguistic demands of this discipline. We're just on our way to work at NASA, sir. I had no idea they hired. There are quite a few women working in the space program. The next generation of brilliant minds at NASA, honoring the women behind hidden figures. KTBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. If you've ever taken a taxi from the airport, then you might know only certain cabs are allowed to give you a ride home. At a meeting today, some push for that to change. KPBS City Heights reporter Taryn Minto is at the airport to tell us how things went. Taryn? Ebony, there are about 1,200 cab drivers in the city of San Diego, and many of them want the opportunity to come down here to the airport and pick up some fares. But only about 360 drivers have that authority, and they want to keep it that way. Look at the numbers. There is no need for additional more cab. But I ask to have the same opportunity for everyone. I have kids. You have kids. A room full of drivers from both sides urged the San Diego Airport Authority to see it their way. Adrian Kwiatkowski of the Transportation Alliance Group represents drivers who already have airport permits. He says if permits are open to all drivers, it'll oversaturate the market and hurt business for everyone. He compared it to when the city opened its taxi permit market in 2014. When the cap was lifted in the city, people thought it would be this flourishing great experiment. There's no business in the city. That's why they want to come to the airport, because there's still some level of business here, but it is diminishing here also. San Diego State University professor Jill Espenshade studied the taxi industry before the city lifted its cap. Back then, she found that the limited number of medallions in the city created a black market. And now she's hearing similar anecdotes about permits for the airport, which means drivers may have to pay high prices to use someone else's permit. Because it's so desirable to drive at the airport, those taxi stickers are now going on a black market for $25,000 to $30,000, which was one of the reasons that the city changed its policies, because their permits, which were $3,000 application fee, were being sold for up to $140,000 on a black market. And this is public property. In the middle of this taxi battle are rideshare companies like Uber and Lyft. The airport has separate agreements with those companies that allow any number of rideshare drivers to pick up at the airport. But those drivers face fewer hurdles than cab drivers to get that authority. For the cab drivers, Kwiatkowski says perhaps there is a different option than just all or nothing. But the two taxi sides haven't come together to discuss it. Now, in the end... Now, in the end, the board did vote to keep things the same. That means that there will be no additional new taxi permits. But one of the board members did say that perhaps when the issue comes up again in three years, things might go a different way. Reporting at the San Diego Airport, I'm Taryn Mento for KPBS News. Thanks, Taryn. A meeting about reopening the Aliso Canyon underground gas storage last night ended early after angry residents shouting shut it down, refused to let the other side speak. The meeting was called by the California Department of Conservation. Aliso Canyon is the largest natural gas storage site in the West and is considered critical for heating Los Angeles area homes. The site has been crippled for more than a year after a leak discovered in 2015 released tons of methane into the atmosphere and drove 8,000 residents from the Porter Ranch neighborhood. 
In the heat of the 2016 campaign season, San Diego Unified board members voted to put together a plan to stop Islamophobia in schools. Part of that plan was in action today, a week after the president signed orders to temporarily ban travel from Muslim-majority countries and crack down on immigration. The Council on American-Islamic Relations visited Logan Elementary School and adapted its training on preventing bullying of Muslim students to help the predominantly Latino campus. To all the people who bully, out, bully Muslims or Latinos, stop it. Treat them with respect. Even though they're from a different race or from a, a different religion, they're still human beings. More than a dozen schools have requested the training since the election. The Dalai Lama is coming back to San Diego. UC San Diego says the exiled spiritual head and leader of the Tibetan people will speak during a private graduation ceremony in June and at a public event the day before. Five years ago, the Dalai Lama spoke at UCSD, the University of San Diego, and San Diego State. These are images from that visit. His San Diego appearance will be the first stop on a U.S. tour. A third of all households in San Diego County aren't bringing in enough money to get by. That's according to a new report from the Center on Policy Initiatives. KPBS reporter Claire Tregesser talked to one preschool teacher who knows the issue all too well. Andrea Kaliki Mestas earns $12 an hour working 40 hours a week. While she earns more than minimum wage, it's still not enough. She recently had to move back in with her mother since she couldn't afford an apartment. You know, we work really hard and we love doing what we're doing, but we still need to be able to um, support our own family, support ourselves. Like Mestas, 33% of all households in the county don't make enough to cover basic living expenses. That includes San Diego-specific costs like housing and child care, which aren't reflected in the federal poverty rate, according to the report. For a single adult with no children, the report says the minimum hourly wage needs to be more than $13 an hour to cover the basics. A single adult with two children would need an hourly wage of more than $30 an hour. Claire Tregesser, KPBS News. The Los Angeles Chargers officially ended their relationship with San Diego this week, sending the city a $12.5 million payment to terminate the team's lease on the Qualcomm Stadium and Murphy Canyon practice facility. The team announced it was moving to L.A. in January. San Diego still has to pay off just over $38 million in loans linked to the expansion of the stadium and practice facility. The San Diego Bike Coalition is expanding into the South Bay and North County. The county's bicycle advocacy group is adding two new project coordinators, one in Chula Vista and another one in Carlsbad. With these additions, the coalition aims to improve biking in the county through education and outreach. Sharp Grossmont Hospital is being sued by its former chief anesthesiologist. He claims Sharp administrators reinstalled secret video cameras to record patients, doctors, and staff without their consent. He also cites safety hazards he says puts lives at risk. Earlier, I checked in with iNews source reporter Cheryl Clark to discuss the claims in this pending lawsuit. So Cheryl, who is Dr. Sullivan and why is he suing the hospital? Well, Ebony, Dr. Sullivan, Patrick Sullivan, is an anesthesiologist. He was the chief of, the, of anesthesiology at the hospital for uh, a couple of years, and he worked there for 22 years. But he claims that he was forced to resign because he complained about a number of problems at the hospital, some of which affected patient safety. And his lawsuit uh, actually sounds like a script from Days of Our Lives. It's like hospital soap opera drama. Uh, nurses uh, fighting over food in the doctor's lounge, hostile workplace in violation of uh, hospital standards, uh, understaffing to a huge degree, drug shortages So to such an extent that um, um, patients uh, who came in to deliver their babies uh, for whom the doctors decided had to have an emergency C-section had um, delays in their anesthesia and delays of, of the uh, surgery, which Dr. Sullivan claims endangered the health of the mother and the baby. What does the hospital say? Well, the hospital uh, is not mm, responding to uh, the allegations, but one of the 
uh, claims in the lawsuit that they did respond to is the claim from Dr. Sullivan that the hospital had reinstalled secret video cameras to secretly record the um, activities inside operating rooms. Now, the last time that happened, which the hospital did acknowledge that they had done um, n numerous m female patients uh, m claim they had their um, privacy breached because they were uh, videotaped and those videotapes uh, got out of the hospital um, for public viewing even though, uh, not public viewing, but mm, the attorney got a hold of it and some other people got a hold of it. So the hospital had to apologize for that. So now Dr. Sullivan is saying that there, the hospital reinstalled those cameras in January of 2016. And to that, Sharp says, absolutely not. The, the doctor is confused because the hospital just bought new equipment and they happen to have those little cameras and, you know, camera holes in the monitors, but they were not active. The software was not activated to videotape that second time in, 20 second, in 2016. And is there any evidence to suggest otherwise? Well, the lawsuit was just filed on January the 13th, and so depositions have not yet begun. And at this point, it's kind of uh, what's the doctor saying about this. But Sharp is denying the video surveillance, and they're just not commenting. Um, the other thing that Sharp is maintaining is that Dr. Sullivan, who claims he was forced to resign for trying to fix uh, the drug shortages and the staffing problems and all of these other things that were going wrong in the hospital, the hostile workplace attitude. Um, the hospital claims that Dr. Sullivan voluntarily resigned, that he was not forced to resign, and therein m may be uh, the basis um, underlying the lawsuit. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Well, thank you very much. Math is a universal language, but math textbooks and standardized tests are not. KPBS education reporter Megan Burke says San Diego educators are working to remove language barriers so students who haven't mastered English can still advance in math. Mariana Moncrief is a math teacher now, but when she started college in the United States, she was put in a remedial math course. Even though I do, did understand the math, I could not pass the test because I didn't know what the questions were. Born in Slovakia, now she's teaching students from all over the world at Hoover High School in City Heights. About 30 percent of the student body there is learning to speak English. Another 50 percent, like Moncrief, speak it as a second language. Also like Moncrief, a lot of them are pretty good at math. Before I show to my students how to solve problems, for example, equation, I ask my students first to come to the board and show me how they do it in their country. And most of the time, um, what I noticed in, in other countries, um, solving equation, for example, it's exactly how I learned in Slovakia. This year, Moncrief and some of her colleagues are meeting after school each week to pore over worksheets and tests. They're dissecting the language both they and their students used in questions and answers. The goal is to find and fix the things that might land English learners in a remedial math class they don't need. For example, this one, um, it says, what does the graph show that they did between this time? Today it's a word problem on slope. A steep line shows miles traveled by bike. Students were asked what it means when that line flattens out. He, he says they are going same miles. Mm. So that's, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a really interesting answer, But right? so, yeah, uh, yeah. As I said, those students cannot express themselves in English very clearly. Mm -hmm. So just like that one sentence, tells me a lot. But when he says same miles, he kind of recognized that around this time we are still at the 20-mile mark. Mm -hmm. Moncrief may understand the answer, but Bill Zahner, who's leading the effort, points out it might not be good enough on a standardized test. Going the same miles, I think what you mean is the distance is not changing, yeah. right? And so there's this idea of giving the students both the credit for coming up with this mathematical explanation and giving them the, um, the words, right, to express that in a way that, that would get them credit 
on another test, right? Zahner is an assistant professor at San Diego State and is researching the intersection of language and mathematics with a grant from the National Science Foundation. We think that mathematics is a universal language. That's a pretty common assumption, right? One plus one is two. It doesn't matter where you are. Uh, but as soon as you ask someone to explain or to justify or to create an argument or to define something, uh, now you've put a linguistic demand on that mathematics. Zahner goes back to the graph, that one with the flat line meaning the cyclist took a break. One of the questions was, you know, what happened on this graph between 11.30 and 12? And there's a horizontal line. And a lot of the students said they stopped for lunch. And then there was explain. And the word explain, I think, was implying, or the author of the word explain thought, give me a mathematical explanation in terms of the graph that you're looking at. Uh, and a number of students wrote, well, usually you eat lunch at 11.30. <laughs> and it's an example of an accurate answer, uh, but not the one that was intended. Zahner and San Diego teachers will spend the next four years finding these overlooked pitfalls. They'll discuss how to overcome them and then present their findings to educators and textbook publishers statewide. Zahner is careful to say the effort isn't about watering down the math. He says often the fix might just be a discussion in class, not a rewrite. Not uh, in 3D plane, but... Yeah. Math teacher Moncrief says talking about it with Zahner and her colleagues has already helped her tap into the talents of her English learners. My students come to class and they want to work. Um, I have not had class where my students would come and not have homework. They do homework, they ask me questions, they... Uh, it's, it's just, it's wonderful. Countywide, there are more than 100,000 English learners who, like Moncrief, just might be math teachers in the making. Megan Burks, KPBS News. California's snowpack has broken a 20-year record just halfway into the winter season. After today's snow survey in the Sierra Nevada, water managers say snow levels are 173 percent of average. The U.S. Drought Monitor also just released its latest report showing more than 49 percent of the state is now free of drought. Still, state water managers have no plan to declare the drought over until later in the year. The drought people look at the state as a whole and you know the various interactions between northern central and southern california so it's you know there's a lot of moving parts to that um, puzzle that are going to be evaluated i'm sure based upon this really good snowpack snow surveyors say they did notice early snow melt in some areas which could result in a need for water releases in march or april if reservoirs get too high Sunshine and clear skies for San Diego. Sounds great, but rain is just around the corner. Shanae Shocker has tonight's forecast. Pacific storms returning across the central and northern California coast. Now we take a look exactly how this plays out. We continue to see this area of low pressure. You can see it right here on our satellite and radar. And that's bringing this cold front onshore and also a lot of subtropical moisture across much of central California. Now the rain going to be held off towards the north of San Diego County for tonight and really more so into tomorrow as well. But the majority of this going to cause some heavy downpours, some flooding rain as well as several feet of snow into the higher elevations above 7,000 feet into the Sierras. So travel conditions uh, up up the coast, that's going to be a little bit of an issue for us. But we're more seeing some cloudier conditions with that moisture passing over. Maybe a drizzle here or there, but overall these clouds not quite packing a punch of any of that precipitation. We can take a look at our satellite and radar. Plenty of cloud cover, especially towards the morning hours, but that has been burning off throughout today. So moving into tonight, we'll stay mostly cloudy as that dip in the jet stream area of low pressure continues to sink over central California. We have a low of 54 degrees degrees. Now into tonight across much of the county, mostly cloudy conditions across the board here. We are right out freezing into Mount Laguna, into Ramona Alpine, into the low to mid 40s, 43 degrees for Borrego Springs. We're gearing our way up the coast into Oceanside, 49 degrees. Now out towards Long Beach, 52. 
and we do see a more spotty chance of a shower there for our Friday especially. Here's a look at our setup for Friday. Area of high pressure inland, and that's what's kind of keeping uh, off towards the south a little bit warmer, however. Now this area of low pressure and this cold front going to be pushing on shore, bringing heavier rounds of rain off towards our north once again. We're more so talking about those showers reaching into San Bernardino County as well as in Orange County around LA. Should be fairly light, though we might have a drizzle. A look at the coast, your five-day extended forecast. Well, our temperatures going to stick right around the mid-60s here. Partly sunny conditions. We'll see some of that cloud cover with the system passing on shore. We'll have another one moving on shore for our Monday, so we could see some showers around the area. Once again, not quite going to be seeing uh, any heavier downpours. Now, with these two systems, high surf advisory is definitely going to be in effect, so we could see dangerous uh, rip current conditions out there for swimmers. So if you're heading out onto the coast, even the jetties with, this, with the higher surf uh, could be a little bit of an issue there. Very dangerous conditions. Other than that though, temperatures and weather are going to look quite nice through the weekend. Inland, pretty much the same deal here. Mostly sunny conditions, though as we build in towards Monday with that second uh, system passing through, we're going to see mostly cloudy conditions. Temperatures right around the mid-60s for our Sunday. And then we head into the mountains. Things going to cool off as we head into our Saturday. We're in the 50s, but then by Sunday back into those 60s. Pretty much a steady weather pattern here with partly cloudy conditions. Seeing some of that sunshine as well. And into the deserts once again. Very steady conditions, so we are going to warm up into our Tuesday with a high of 82 degrees. For KPBS News, I'm Shanae Shocker. You can find amazing women behind nearly every epic project. Hidden Figures focuses on three genius women who help launch America's race into space. The stars can't get enough of this photographic homage. Three Milwaukee students dressed up as Dorothy Vaughn, Katherine Johnson, and Mary Jackson, the NASA workers who helped send John Glenn into orbit. Actress Taraji Henson shared the photo on Instagram saying, I do what I do so the baby can dream. Women were among the computing pioneers. Many programmed the first digital computers. NPR Planet Money reporter Gaitlin Kinney and Steve Hinn take a look at how women went from being at the center of the computing world to being sidelined. Computer science today is a male dominated field. We know this. I've been meeting these women, women whose names we should know too. Badass computing pioneers. Women who are now in their 70s and 80s, but who programmed some of the first digital computers back in the days when software was written in machine language, in binary. So how did women go from being the center of the computing world, the pioneers of the industry, to being sidelined? I think the answer lies somewhere in this graph. It's a graph of the percentage of women studying computer science. And it compares those numbers to the numbers of women studying medicine and law and physical sciences. And, you know, the number of women in all these fields are all going up. But then something big happens, something that changes the course of computer science. And what's amazing about that is you can actually put your finger on the moment where this changed. It was 1984. There was no grand conspiracy in computer science that we uncovered. There was no sign on a door that said, girls, keep out. In 1984, you couldn't succeed in a computer science program without having had a home computer. And this bled into the workforce. Even if you weren't studying computer science, but you wanted to work on it, you needed the experience of using one, of playing with one. Early home computers popped up in the places that were already the world of boys. This morning, Brian Scott made a career decision. He decided to be an astronaut. His first giant step, learning to use an apple. Jane Margolis is an education researcher who's now at UCLA, and she has a theory about this. Take this one student Jane interviewed named Lily. She was the one who was really into computers in high school. But even though she was the one who was really into computers, the computer was placed in her brother's room. Once you have something like this happening, it reinforces itself. Computers are for boys. They are boy toys that boys use to do boy things. And this became a narrative, this story we told ourselves. Margolis had some idea about how this had happened, but she wanted to figure out how to stop the clock, how to reverse this, how to find a way to get women back in. 
Margalis did her research with a guy named Alan Fisher, who was the Dean of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon at the time. To give girls a chance to make up for what they missed in those years when boys were messing around with computers in their bedrooms, Carnegie Mellon added an intro course for students who didn't have a lot of informal computer science experience. They started paying a lot more attention to teaching. And it worked. By 2000, 42% of the computer science students at Carnegie Mellon were women. And the dropout rate for men and women was basically the same. You can find the Planet Money podcast on iTunes or Google Play. President Trump poked some fun at Arnold Schwarzenegger today at the National Prayer Breakfast, asking the crowd of about 2,000 to pray for the former California governor and his low ratings since he took over Trump's gig at Celebrity Apprentice. But Schwarzenegger shot back, posting this response on Twitter. Hey, Donald, I have a great idea. Why don't we switch jobs? You take over TV because you're such an expert in ratings, and I take over your job and then people can finally sleep comfortably again. Hmm? Trump re retains a financial stake in the show and is listed as an executive producer. Take a look at that. Over 80 Yorkies are now up for adoption. This one month after authorities seized 120 of them from a home in Poway. But we're told they're in good shape from vaccinations to dental care. The dogs are ready to find a permanent home. Those interested can apply at sdhumane.org by Saturday at noon. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.